It is Monday, February 13th. Welcome to Menace to Sports. I am Zach Smith, your host, with my co-host, Chris Drew. Big Chris Drew, Akron Ver- Akron's very own. Just a, a PSA to all of the men watching the show. It is one day away from Valentine's. Don't forget, go get some shit today so you're not scrambling tomorrow. This is just my my give back to uh to to the to the viewers, to the watchers. And shout out to Menace to Picks who absolutely scorched earth. We um, we had Mensa on on Friday. I hope you paid attention. I hope you listened and watched cuz he swept every single prop bet on the Super Bowl hit. We hit a soccer parlay in a war room that was kind of separate from Menace to Picks. What else did we hit? We were hitting everything. Oh, everything we hit a golfer. Hit. Scotty Scheffler wins the Waste Management Open. We put that out as a golf pick on, on Wednesday. I, I, something like 150 units in one day. I know myself, I won two grand yesterday. Two grand on the Super Bowl. And I, I got to tell you, Chris, I bet on the Chiefs because I just, I didn't trust that Patrick Mahomes and Andy Reid were going to lose mm-hmm. to the Eagles, especially because the Eagles' path to the Super Bowl was the Giants, who are fucking terrible, and the 49ers without a quarterback. I didn't believe it. But at halftime, I'm questioning like a son of a bitch my bet, and I'm looking at that cash-out <laughs> option. I put 800 on the Chiefs to win. It's like cash-out for 300. Like, damn, maybe I should just cut my losses and get my 300 back. But then Justine was the one that was like, no, what are you talking about? We, we, didn't, bet, we didn't bet on the Chiefs to cash out at halftime. She's a real goat here. So I didn't cash out, and I cashed out on the, on the final score winner. We're going to talk about the Super Bowl. We're going to talk about Patrick Mahomes, the holding penalty, the controversy, the zebras influencing everything. And also, Gene Smith is building a hockey rink. What a time. (laughs) But enough about the intro, Chris. Let's get to the show. My guy. All right. First things first. It's three days till the Big Red Boots came out. I want to ask you, is someone at Ohio State listening to the show? Because as soon as we dropped the show last last. Last week, talking about big red boots. What did we get? Marv. We got a terrible Photoshop of Marv in some big red boots on the page. The more I think about it, the more I think we got to we got to go get them. Absolutely, absolutely not. But it is funny. It's that time of year. It's been ever since we I started this show. Every off season, everyone struggles for something to talk about, right? Mm-hmm. Because it's like, oh, it's a college football show. I can tell stories about college football, so I do have one kind of leg up on most people. But, you know, there's not a lot going on, especially the month of February. Once March hits, we're going to be talking spring ball, depth charts, you know, just practice, spring practice, what's going on. Like, there's stuff to talk about all spring. Summer, you hit a little lull, but you're getting gearing up for for the season, and and it's here. So this is the time where it's so slow, and it's amazing, isn't it? Mm -hmm. We do a show. And you see the little fucking articles go out everywhere. I love it. Warrior, I love Buckeye it. Buckeye beats. It's like we, we talked about Jaden Ballard eclipsed 24 miles an hour. Chris sent me a tweet today. Someone reporting that Jaden Ballard broke 24 miles an hour. It's like, oh, no shit. Where'd you learn that? <laughs> yeah, it said rumor. I was like, oh, all right. That's that's what we're on. Um, it is funny because some sites have have not tried as hard in previous years to make it seem like it didn't come from you. I remember reading the article. It, the article opened up as Zach Smith said, and it's like, all right, like, hey, at least – I like should give credit, right? That's your flowers right. a little bit. And I saw our guy Rod Farver put in the chat. Pitchers and catchers reported today. I'm a huge baseball fan. Um, not you know, I'm a, I'm a casual. Yeah. Like I like watching baseball. If it's you a like big baseball game, baseball more game. than basketball. Oh my god, yeah. Well, not not just college, not just pro. I mean, just, I like at all levels. Yeah, I mean, my, my son plays baseball at, 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 a, at a high level. I mean, travel baseball, eat whatever you want to call it, mm-hmm. elite travel baseball, and has. I mean, he was an elite travel baseball at nine U, but he's played travel baseball for the last five years. And I love it. He loves it. I've I've dove into baseball, learned so much. I've been studying it like I want to be a baseball coach just because my kid (laughs) plays it. And my daughter plays softball, and my younger two will also play softball and baseball. Although my youngest is a fucking savage. I mean, he's going to be a wrestler football. Like, I don't know. He might be a power hitter. I don't know. But he's not like like Cam. is. he's He's an outfielder, you know, middle infielder, pitcher. Like, can run decent. Like, my my youngest, Luke, he is going to be a catcher. He is going to, I mean, hit tanks. I don't know. If he plays baseball, he's going to be a meathead baseball player. I mean, hey, we can get him in the gym now. If he wants to start boxing, we can we can arrange something. I'm, he's going to do all that. He Last night, we're watching the Super Bowl at one of Cam's friends' houses. One of our friends, one of our good friends. We're watching the Super Bowl in their basement. There's three 13-year-old boys, and this two-year-old is just fucking them up. I mean, like <laughs> tackling them, choking them, like pushing their head into the ground. I'm like, this kid is a problem. Like, Hasbula. <laughs> a true menace. 
he is he is some and he's he's such a smart and well-behaved kid but when it's time to play rough he has no fear i love that kid, it's man. amazing but chris i i wanted to start this show off with a little trivia for the chat i need you to tell me which i'm going to describe i'm, I'm going to give you a rap sheet on a group of people and i want you to tell me this was sent to us it was sent to me from a former Buckeyes parent, actually going to be drafted here soon, just this morning, and I watched it like jaw dropped. Which group of people is this? NBA or NFL? All right? This group of people has 36 people accused of spousal abuse. Seven members, people, in this group have been arrested on fraud. 19 for writing bad checks. 117 of them have bankrupted two or more businesses. Three of them have done actual time for assault. They've been arrested and did jail time. They did time for assault. 71 can't get a credit card due to bad credit. 14 drug arrests, charges and arrests. Eight have been arrested for shoplifting. 21 defendants in lawsuits. 84 DUIs in the last calendar year. NBA or NFL? I, I said see, I said NBA when I first saw. I thought that. NBA too. I, I see people NBA. spoiling it in the in the in the chat here. That is that group of people would be your 435 members of the United States Congress. <laughs> that is fucking wild. That members of Congress have that type of rap sheet. Mm -hmm. Politicians, the most corrupt motherfuckers alive. Yep. And the problem with this country, we could talk about all the bullshit. Republicans are the problem. Democrats are the problem. Racism's the problem. Like sexual assaults. Now the fucking biggest problem in America are those 435 sons of bitches sitting in Congress and the presidents and everybody. Politicians are the issue. I thought that was nuts because like people love to like, like make villains out of these NBA players and these M and, like out of uh, NFL players too. Like you become the most famous, you know, for your play inside of this. And then you get villainized for, yeah. for, for that kind of thing. When like people who are making the laws are getting, getting accused of this stuff and and proving that they did this stuff and it's not nearly as big of a story it's crazy it's crazy i i, I was blown away Chris, by it because i thought 16 percent sure. of the people that are are approving budgets and have insider infos insider trading 16 percent of the united states congress can't get a credit card yeah like what are we doing mm -hmm. and never mind that i mean that's just that's financial irresponsibility let alone duis and shit like that it's crazy. Yeah, the, a lot of people are talking about the uh, the Ohio train wreck, too. It's like, that's not getting any pub. But, you know, God forbid <laughs> some athletes say no homo on national television, and that's the, that's oh, the next God. story. No, he said no homo. <laughs> hey, man, that's – that's it, it's insane, and it's it's a shame, and it's sad. Um, but, Zach, I wanna, I'm going to move ahead a little bit. Now that we're no longer talking about the big red boots, they come out on the 16th. Wink, wink, Zach. Um, <sighs> Super Bowl. Chris wants a bonus. It's like – yeah. <laughs> Super Bowl. Um, really good game, I thought, and I kind of want your take on the game. It is a shame that that game kind of came down to that penalty there at the end. Um, but, you know, a, a lot of a lot of general thoughts from this game. I kind of want to open up the conversation with, like, passing you the torch. What did you think watching the Super Bowl? I thought it was a great game. Mm -hmm. I mean, a great game all the way till the end. I, th I think the referees interjected themselves like they have all year and have really in recent history. And – they decided the outcome of the game. I, I mean, was it a penalty? Yes. Mm -hmm. You can't hold a, 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 you can't grab his jersey in transition on a little pivot wheel. Like, and, and the DB even admitted that it was holding. He hoped he could get away with it. In my opinion, let him play. Exactly. And here, because pass is incomplete. They're kicking a field goal. You're going to see with a minute, 10 seconds left, can Jalen Hurts drive down the field and tie the game? Like, that's what we want to see. We want to see, can Jalen Hurts tie it up? And if he can't, the Chiefs' defense stops him. The Chiefs are, are rightful Super Bowl champions. But I, I hate when refs get involved. It, it's just – it's it's absurd. Yeah, Zach, what was your opinion on the Devontae Smith catch and the late penalty on Bat, um, Bradbury? Thought you could put your hands on the wide receiver within the first five yards. You could be physical, but you can't you can't grab them and hold yeah. them on their route. Which it, it was, I think the extent of the rule is any contact other than grabbing, tripping, and yeah, contact holding. to the head. Yeah, mm -hmm. and holding. Yeah. Right? You can't yeah. hold – you can't. You could play physical, but you can't grab and hold his jersey in transition. Like you can grab and hold him and, and and run with him, but if he tries to change direction and you tug him like a slingshot, and it was minimal, but it was a penalty. Uh, it just it, it it is what it is. I mean, it's. I'll tell you what though, 
The Eagles got the QB sneak down pat. Yeah, they do. Holy shit! The QB sneaks and the and the uh, and the like the powers on, on the outside or whatever that is the counters the QB counters. Oh, well, they, they ran a QB sweep for a touchdown, but those yeah. Q, those QB sneaks are three four yards a pop. Mm -hmm. I really think they could just drive down the field and do that shit and score touchdowns every drive. And a lot of that has has, has to do with Jalen Hurts. I mean, people don't realize like he's a guy that fell in love with power lifting, and and that's you know it shows because he's. He's wide. He's got a wide back, strong legs. Like he loves powerlifting, and it shows kind of on the game. I don't know if it's conducive to being able to win long term. Um, it, it is interesting, though, kind of that they were able to make the Super Bowl playing like this, given that there is and, and real enough super passing attack. And you know what else was was atrocious was the field. Mm -hmm. And I, I mm -hmm. we played in I think three bowl games there in Arizona at that stadium where they have the, the real grass field. It's really cute. They can wheel it out to get so it can sunbathe. It can get a tan, and they can wheel it back in. And every they spent eight hundred grand at a at a turf farm to buy that field. And every time I've ever we've ever played in it, the shit is fucking terrible. Yeah, it's not deep rooted. It's it it's it comes out. I mean, the kicker kicked the kickoff and fell down, almost broke his ankle because the turf gave oh, way. J.K. Dobbins fucked his ankle. It's terrible that field. Yeah, it's terrible. And when we played, I think it was the two thousand six national championship game. Boise State had just played Oklahoma, and you walked on the field and literally. The field that Oklahoma played on was here. And then, you you know, two steps later, you stepped onto another field that was our field. They just put it on top of the Oklahoma field. It's just, it's awful. And I know they're trying to be cute with, uh, with like, real grass in a dome. But, like, that shit is terrible. And it's a disservice to, to the, game. the game, truly. And I, I saw this. Shout out, Nick. Oh, my bad. Menace, menace, uh, menace to picks. Friday picks. Mensa. He spent $70 on did a five-leg parlay and walked out with $1,100. This shit is for real. If you're gambling and haven't checked it out, the props alone are worth every penny. Then you throw in Mr. Sharp. He, I got a call from our Sharp better on this is Sunday. So, this is so cool. Two o'clock on Sunday. He calls me up. He said, hey, thoughts on the uh, over-under on the national anthem? And I was like... I mean, my thoughts are over because he's a country music star. He'll come out with a guitar. He'll play... You know, it'll draw it out, the, the guitar aspect. And he was like, no, we need hammer the under. He was like, I'm looking for any book that has it. I'm trying to bet 50 grand on the under. I was like, what? <laughs> Why? 50 grand? Like, you have that big of a an inkling on that he's going to go under? So the under at the time was two minutes, seven seconds. He sang it, I think, in 201.99. So it, it hit by five seconds for his under, for the under at the time he called me because he has, he has an insider that played in a band with Chris Stapleton. Chris Stapleton has public anxiety, biggest stage he's ever played on. He said he is going to try to just knock it out, get it done, get out of there with a, with a solid performance. He is not trying to draw this out. I was like, shit. Sure enough. They say fear speeds you up. It, it hit the under. So the menace to picks is, is operating different. And then, Chris, you got your happy 13th uh, day of Black History Month from Gorky. We appreciate you, Gorky. Yeah, working our way to some big red boots. We're getting there. <laughs> We are we are on the way, um, Zach. Another another thing that I thought was crazy after the game. There's like two different sides of, of Patrick Mahomes, um, and it's crazy because, oh yeah, Mensa, he asked if Mensa's Gainwell pick. Hit. Yeah, over yeah. over ten and a half carries, or I think it was it was over. I was over like five carries because I oh, played yeah. it. Yeah, I played five it over five. Yeah, Pacheco was the over eleven. Yeah, yeah, both yeah. both running back carries hit. They both hit. I think the the Gainwell hit one in the first half like it hit really really early yeah so shout out to him but uh Patrick Mahomes after the game obviously wins the Super Bowl and there's like two different universes with the Patrick Mahomes stuff like you you see Jackson Mahomes on one side <laughs> and then you see his his dad's like talking about smoking on that Philly pack yeah why did Jackson Mahomes while he was giving the interview walk behind Patrick because to do some like what are we doing like he's a fucking clown douchebag like he is the epitome of a douchebag I know people want to talk about he's he's flaming gay and all this other stuff. I don't care about that. Like, I, I said it on JB's show this morning. He's a douchebag. And my biggest problem with him is he can't dance. He's an awful dancer. It's like if you were this flaming douchebag that was out there dancing, but you were just hitting it, it'd be like, oh, well, the guy's a good dancer. He, he's flamboyant and a douche, but he's a fucking awful dancer. He's obnoxious. I, I, if I'm Patrick Mahomes, I'm not giving him tickets to anything. It was just like, my brother just won his second Super Bowl. He is now going to enter rare air, and we're going to talk about it, because now for Patrick Mahomes, it's not, for me at least, I don't know how you feel, it's not going to be about the Hall of Fame. It's not going to be about being considered one of the, the best quarterbacks in the league now. Right now, for Patrick Mahomes, and kind of the projection is, we are climbing a mountain. 
And I got this dude behind me taking one of these mo- one of these mountain climbing moments from me. And that's what really frustrates me, especially because Pat's dad does it perfectly. Pat's dad will give you one line every eight weeks and then out. Doesn't yeah. want to be a celebrity. Not about me. Not about building his brand. If you're Jackson Mahomes, it's like you don't have to build a brand. Your brother is generationally wealthy and obviously taking care of you. So why are you taking moments away from Right, him? like go run his fucking CBD shop or go run his car dealership and get paid a, a big amount of money and, and, and it's all good. Mm-hmm. I don't know why, and never mind that. Like I get it, you want to build your own brand, stand on your own two feet. Who the fuck wants their brand to be one of the most hated douchebags in sports? Because that is what his brand is. Might be the most hated douchebag in sports. And that's, hey, power to you, man. You're building a brand. People know you. you. I want to ask about the Eagles. Um, the Eagles obviously made it to a Super Bowl. Jalen Hurts, you know, there's a lot of opinions about him, about his future. Uh, I, I just, I'm, I'm questioning, question for you. How much do you think he's worth, at, you know, as a quarterback when his rookie deal is up? Like, how much would you pay him? And do you think the Eagles can get back to the Super Bowl when he's not on his rookie deal anymore? Well, it depends on how how big, you know, what his va- market value is. Mm-hmm. I, I he I think Jalen Hurts was outstanding. I mean, 70 yards rushing, three touchdowns, the QB sneaks alone. I mean, there's times where it's not just it's not just because the guys behind him are pushing. I mean, this this son bitch is a power runner. And I think he he has a lot of value, but he just doesn't throw it as well as some other quarterbacks. And you wonder without that defense, right? With, with without AJ Brown, I mean, can he really dominate? Could he if you switch teams and put him on the Chiefs? Would they have won the Super Bowl? No, is the answer. I don't. I don't believe so. He threw for over three hundred yards, right? He he was decent. I mean, he had he had a QB rating over hundred. Right. I, I thought he played well. I don't know that he's in that upper echelon of quarterbacks when it comes to throwing the football. No, I know he's not, but he has a lot of value on the ground. A lot of value. It's almost like Russell Wilson when he won his first Super Bowl in in Seattle. Obviously, yeah. you had like Legion of Boom, you had Marshawn Lynch, you had a really dynamic run game. Like you had a really good roster, and they yeah. were able to win because of that, like that. And then after Russell got paid, now Russell had to go prove that he was a really good passer and was pinpoint dudes up. Um, but now we've seen you know another quarterback in that system do well, and we've seen Russ obviously fall off. So I I do think it's really interesting. Uh, our guy Jeremy in the chat reminds me of Dak's situation as well. Yeah, really good roster, but yeah. like, is he worth paying over twenty five million a year? Because when you do that. All of a sudden, you maybe you get one good receiver. I mean, the answer is no, right? He Jalen Hurts can be very successful in the NFL, but he needs those pieces around him. So if you're going to pay him that kind of money, you can't have the pieces around him. He's not worth that kind of money, right? He's only worth that kind of money because of the roster that you no longer could have yeah. if you paid him that kind of money. So the answer is no, but it doesn't mean he won't get it somewhere. Right, and, and it's kind of up for discussion for me at least I, i've always told you i don't believe in signing a quarterback to over 25 million dollars if you don't make it to an, an afc or nfc title game on your rookie deal like i won't i won't do it i don't believe that you deserve yeah. that second contract unless you do that yeah. so it, it is it is interesting well, and that, it bodes the question right people are talking about pat mahomes and now he's he's entered that rare era. you even mm-hmm. said it he's a multiple super bowl winner and and kind of the problem i have with how we evaluate quarterbacks in the nfl is that and i think patrick mahomes is great i think amazing if he could, I mean, he just continues his career like uh, like normal. Doesn't even level up. Doesn't like break a bunch of records. Like if he just continues down this path, he's a first ballot Hall of Famer without a doubt. But here's my issue with with you. You talked about it, Peyton Manning or Tom Brady. Well, Tom Brady has seven Super Bowls. Okay, relax. You tell me who's the best quarterback on this list: Brad Johnson, Mark Rippian, Jeff Hostetler, Doug Williams, Jim Plunkett, Trent Dilfer, Dan Marino. Dan Marino. He's the only one on that list that hasn't won a Super Bowl. Mm -hmm. So at what point is quarterback play just quarterback play? Because it's hard to win a Super Bowl. You need to have the right roster, the right pieces. And there is something to be said about being able to win it all when you get to the doorstep. Yeah, like having the clutch gene. But to sit here and say that fucking Jim Plunkett is better than Dan Marino because he he has a Super Bowl ring? Mm -hmm. Just absurd. It's absurd. Yeah, and then here we go, Zach. Like, who's better all time? Aaron Rodgers or Eli Manning? Aaron Rodgers. But who has more rings? Eli. Yeah. So that's that's kind of what what we're what we're looking at and thinking about. And before the show, I I brought this up real briefly. Um, I I consider Tom Brady the greatest ever, but I also know it's not fair because I think that when him and Peyton Manning were both in their prime, I thought that Peyton Manning was a better player. Yeah. And I, I don't disagree. And and you I think I think you can say that. 
and then kind of start to understand. Now, I still have Brady as the GOAT, but I just think that that's kind of an important thing to, to think about. Yeah, for sure. Justin Fields is a poor man's Jalen Hurts. That's cap. That's big, big cap. Justin Fields, I mean, similar running ability. Justin's more of a home run threat. Jalen probably offers a little more in the power run game, but Justin's a better passer. He is. Uh, it's, he's just a better passer. I mean, what do you, if you put Justin Fields on the Eagles, they certainly get to the Super Bowl, and I don't know if they win it, but he, he replicates the same success. I mean, that you you talked about that path. Yes. Yeah. Like, absolutely. Yeah, like, absolutely. yes, yes, Justin Fields would beat Daniel Jones and and whoever, who, what, well, not even Brock Purdy. No. Yes. Yes. Here yes is the answer. Yes is the answer. But also, th appreciate the five, T-Shaw. He said, anyone who bets on sports and risks more than 50 a month is doing themselves a, a disservice by not signing up. Just the chat in the war room is worth it. I'm trying to tell you, if you if you enjoy sports gambling, it is – it's an expense. Like, don't view it as some, like, get-rich-quick scheme. But the war room conversations alone give you intel and information. It, it, it's, it's worth every penny. Yes, I mean, it. shit, I'm cashing out my dumbass. <laughs> Zach, Zach makes fun or laughs at me every morning. I come in here and talk about how Mince is my best friend, even though we've spoken all of, like, six times. Right. <laughs> like, like Mince is my guy. Uh, Jake, all right, we'll get off the NFL talk here real briefly. Uh, at some point, Zach and Chris, I know y'all love Joe Burrow, but I'm sorry, Pat Mahomes is him and everyone else is chasing him. I think in the in the category of Super Bowl wins, yes, absolutely. I like the long term value with Joe Burrow more because I think his style of play is more sustainable and, and conducive to success. Yeah, I, I think I, that a part but, but of that. You're honestly, in my opinion, talking about the two best quarterbacks in the NFL. Yeah. So it, yeah, there's a fine line. Pat Mahomes is certainly leading the the charge right now, but Joe Burrow is also him. Yeah, Joe Burrow is also him, and also him without Andy Reid. I think that that's kind of an important caveat uh, the, when I when I kind of talk about that kind of thing. But for Joe Burrow, Zach, you got to feel like the clock's kind of ticking for him to get one. Yeah, um, I mean, you got you got to he's got to get it next year. Or, well, it's next year's his last year on the rookie deal. Like you got you got to get it. Got to get it next year. Um, and, and and they're both twenty six years old, and it is really cool because we are. This is at least not maybe not for you because you were more of a football guy in like the Peyton versus Tom era. You know they were denying each other Super Bowls, basically, yeah. but one denying the other one. Right now, for me, this is what that is. Like, like Joe and, and Pat is my version of Tom and Peyton Manning in terms of, like, denying guys Super Bowls. Yeah, I mean, it's early on, but if, right. they, if they continue this little rivalry that they're building, it certainly will become the kind of Peyton versus Tom Brady era. Mm -hmm. And that's that's kind of what I'm uh, what I'm hoping for. But, you know, one more year, they're the same age. He's got to get one. Pressure's on as – the sights are set for Joe Burrow to get a Super Bowl. Right now, the sights are set for Pat Mahomes to start climbing that mountain. Mm -hmm. Like, when can we start talking about him, you know, being with those other guys? And for me, it's going to take a couple more years. Yeah. All right, Mike Renner, just drop the list. Wake up. I mean, this. so this is our dumbass sports media personality of the week. Go figure, it's from Pro Football Focus. Uh, this dumb son of a bitch. We got player comps. My least favorite thing in the world, right? Like, J.K. Dobbins is Alvin Kamara. You're like, what the fuck? Okay, you're a fucking idiot. Here's his here's his player comps. CJ Stroud is like Ryan Tannehill. <laughs> Anthony Richardson is like Josh, Josh Allen. Allen. And Tanner McKee is like whoever the fuck that is. I don't know. Kerry Collins. Collins. <laughs> Kerry Collins. <laughs> this is the dumbest shit I think I've seen in a long time. To say Anthony Richardson is Josh Allen. I mean, you can kind of get behind some similarities. Between C.J. Stroud and Ryan Tannehill, I, I can't. I don't think. I mean, not really. Yeah. But it's it's not near as egregious as Anthony Richardson is Josh Allen. Give me a one to ten. How fucking awful that is. I mean, that's the worst shit I've ever seen. I don't know who Mike Renner is, but that's the dumbest motherfucker that is collecting a salary to cover sports. Is that list a fireable offense? Uh, I mean, the, yes, absolutely. <laughs> if Chris, if you put that out on Menace to Sports, I promise you. The first step would be I would revoke all rights to social media and speaking. You could be a behind-the-scenes producer. You would never be allowed on air again. And that's only because I like you. <laughs> if I didn't like you, I would just fire you on the spot. That's just horrendous. <laughs> Clip that, y'all. Zach said he likes me. <laughs> I would never put that bullshit it's, out, bro. That's fucking that's, terrible. That's, you know I would like never if you put want, that out. If you want a good comparison for Anthony Richardson, you could go Dak Prescott or Jalen Hurts. Right, those Close, are closer than Josh Allen. Right, like a good athlete. Yeah, Cam New, you didn't inconsistent like throwing the ball, but Josh Allen. I know Josh Allen's a good athlete, but Anthony Richardson is not even close to the passer Josh Allen is. Mm -hmm. 
It's, oh, no. it's nasty Horrendous. work. And, and who would you compare, like, C.J. Stroud to? What do you think? I mean, I don't know. I, I hate player comparisons. I would I would compare C.J. Stroud more to Josh Allen than I would Anthony Richardson. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, I would give him, like, Geno Smith. I think it's a, it's a decent comp for him. Um, yeah, I think C.J. Ceiling's higher than Geno's, but... Maybe Matt Ryan, maybe Jared Goff. Like it just it just feels like instead of picking a quarterback that thrives in like a power system that was an X wide receiver that like hands the ball to Derrick Henry, comparing him to Ryan Tannehill just feels goofy. Yeah, it it does. It like, does. Like what are we doing here? So if I'm if I'm gonna compare, I'm gonna compare CJ to to a guy like Goff or Matt Ryan. And then I'll, I mean I think Tanner McKee, honestly, like like to <laughs> to go Kerry Collins felt so random. Like, Kerry Collins of yeah. all people? Like, second of all, why are you even have Tanner McKee on this list? Like, Bryce Young's not available and, like... I kind of agree with T. Shaw. CJ, CJ Stroud is a more athletic but doesn't run very often to show it Aaron Rodgers. Like, he makes every throw. It's He has pinpoint accuracy. Kind of don't love his demeanor and off the field, like, his approach, right? Aaron Rodgers is not that dynamic, square-jawed leader that's just, like, exudes enthusiasm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> he kind of looks like a homeless guy in the offseason. Like... I, I, I kind of like that comparison. He, he reminds me of just Falcons, Matt Ryan. Like if I'm going to yeah, like have, a I, I can see that too. He, he'll move around a little bit. They have that, that similar, like long frame, long throwing motion, but also like the, the Tanner McKee one on the end of it is, is, is foolish. Like compare him to Daniel Jones. If you're, if you want to compare him to a giant, compare him to Alex Smith, if you want to, it just, it just feels odd. And to, to leave Bryce young and Will Levis off your draft comparisons and jump straight to Tanner also felt weird. Yeah. What is that? Yeah. Like he's, he's what at best, the fifth best quarterback coming out. Yeah, like he's not better than Hendon. Yeah, it's probably like six. Yeah, he's maybe not, seventh. He's not better than Levis. Yeah, it's just com completely out of touch. But when you compare fucking Anthony Richardson to Josh Allen, I guess that's where the conversation stops. This is the issue. It becomes so much about clip cl clicks that you don't care about your credibility. Like Mike Renner just he blew it. Yeah, he blew it. It's over. But he'll keep his job though. PFF loves him. Why well, compare? You we compare for the clicks. Yeah, I don't. I fucking hate comparisons. He does. But I, if if someone's gonna put a bad one out, let me give you one that's at least halfway decent. Yes, something something a little better. But look, there we go. We did our jobs better than PFF. We got more clicks from it, um, and we also gave some some plus content. Yeah, but if, I saw it in the chat. If you just watched the Georgia game, CJ's com comparison is Michael fucking Vick. CJ Lamar Vick. Jackson. <laughs> hey, we love CJ Vick. We we coined that we coined that phrase here on the show. Um, I want to stay on CJ Stroud. I don't, I don't know if you saw it, but he, you know he's making his little draft rounds, giving the interviews, all that. It's it's kind of that time of the year. While yeah. things are going to get really really slow here, guys are getting ready for the combine. You're getting you know all these sound bites. He said that uh, that Ohio State fans use DMs through mobile money app to criticize his pay. They were hitting him with the Venmo to talk mess. It feels a lot like Michigan fans and Georgia fans that came on this show dropping super chats to talk shit to, to the to our viewers and us even though we're pretty unbiased i know we have a little bias but i mean i'm i'm more biased than you but i guess it, it wasn't hate it was just shit talking i'm sure cj got more hate than yeah. than than we got but no, we we get the we get the hate watchers yeah for sure for sure but fuck it i'm here for it cj should just enjoy the 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 free money mm -hmm. that means shit i would have been like damn like damn i suck and i'll never beat michigan all right, bet. Hey, y'all, steak's on me tonight. Yeah, like, right. That's that's what I'm on. That's like, the type of timing I'm on. 0-2 against Michigan, but I'm eating at fucking Jeff Ruby's on mm -hmm. your dime. Appreciate you. <laughs> it is it is kind of bizarre. Now, a lot of people were tagging me on this and thinking, you know what? Like, is that an NCAA violation? I don't, th I don't think it is. No, name, image, and likeness. Exactly. R truly a name, image, and likeness. And, and appreciate it, Chris, for the two. CJ, Deshaun Watson's a great comp. I think Deshaun Watson's a great comp for CJ Stroud. I think, yeah, like, if if he buys into running like that, like that Georgia game was a like great comp. If if you're if you're thinking Deshaun Watson, mm -hmm. I think so. So we'll see. Now is that? Oh, oh goodness gracious! I love Brian. Brian, our resident Michigan fan. <laughs> Chad Henney with two more rings than any Ohio State quarterback. Listen, I I could have gotten two those two rings. Yeah. What are we talking about? Gifted the two rings. No, he did well when Mahomes got hurt. That, no, he not did entirely fair. He, he he did his job. Yeah, he did his job. They gave him the Alex Smith playbook and said, go do it. And he did it. So, so more, more power to him. Zach, it is funny. If you were an athlete, if you were a five-star athlete or currently on a team, would you post your Venmo just like in your bio? Because I would. Yeah, why not? Like, it's it's not illegal, right? No, it's not illegal. And if you're going to investigate, it's not like the – it's not like the 
I mean, it might be illegal. Like, if you're not doing shit for money and fans are just paying you for no reason because you're a great player, that certainly is illegal. But, but what are you supposed to do? It's Venmo. Send it back, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, right. Well, I, I mean, maybe, maybe it's illegal. But on the flip side, like, we just watched a GoFundMe go up to keep Michigan players there. Yeah, but, th- but they're going to have to do something for that money, mm-hmm. though. Right? That's what it is. You have to go to an event or do something to get paid with NIL money. Like you have to do something charitable. You can't just get paid money because your name is CJ Stroud and you don't have to do anything. That's pay to play. They're paying you because you're a good player. Got you. Well, I guess, I guess I don't know where the, like the lines blur because say CJ Stroud hopped on YouTube and, and slept on YouTube and got a bunch of super chats. Is that illegal? No, I, mean, I don't know. That's, I have no idea. <laughs> I mean, that's what I would do. Just open up a stream, let people donate. Right. Why not? How much money do you think he made from uh, from shit talkers? And are those real fans? Probably just a couple hundred bucks. That's fair. That's fair. Um, want to want to move ahead a little bit. Um, we have a retirement from the Notre Dame side, and I want to use this kind of first of all as a a coach's check in. What are coaches up to this time of year? Well, I mean, we, we kind of talked about it earlier in the week. I mean, this is truly the time to build the culture of your team, right? You're, you're still recruiting. A, a, I mean, you're always a recruiting, but it's not as intense. You're not traveling. K- kids aren't coming on campus. And you're truly going through off-season, the off-season program with your players. You're doing classroom sessions, teaching them, especially young kids, just trying to level up their football IQ, teach them the offense better, like like go through their individual cut-ups to, to work on their fundamentals. You have drill sessions with your kids. You know, after a workout, you'll get 15 minutes of individual. You're in the weight room with your players as they, you know, go through this grueling winter program, trying to build culture and develop those players. This is truly that intimate time that coaches have with their players. Probably the most intimate time outside of season in a very different light. This is all about development. Season's all about winning the game, right? So this is this is a cool time. I mean, you go through winter conditioning and then into spring ball, and it's truly – and spring ball is a little different – because you have kids visiting on set to a Saturday scrimmage, you know, kids will come on campus. So you got to do a little more recruiting in spring, but this next, you know, we start February one to, to May one. That is the most critical. That's the meat of development outside of training camp. That is the time where you are solely focused on developing your players. How do you teach a kid the playbook more? Like, or especially like, like guys who are early enrollees, like how, how do you build the blocks for teaching a playbook? Is it more just kind of, sitting them through and going through it because a lot of times I think about when I was in math class kind of struggling a little bit teacher would like walk me through things be like you get it and I'd be like yeah and I I never got it do right. you ever run into that as a coach or do you like quiz them along the way or yeah like- you, you do all kinds of things it's truly it's being a high level teacher that's what it is I mean you do you do little pop quizzes you do little tip sheets reviews I mean it's it's truly be trying to be a great teacher like if you could teach if you teach a, a receiver the offense and you know math you could teach a math student math right mm-hmm. because you're truly learning teaching methods. I mean, we used to meet with learning specialists to learn ourselves the best way that our players learned. I mean, they'd have individual breakdowns of each kid and what their learning strengths are, what their learning deficiencies are. Like if, if, if a kid is a, a motor learner and not an audio learner for you to sit there and explain things to the kid all over and over again is dumb. That's not how, it's not the best way he learns. Like a motor learner needs to go out on the field and you need to talk through concepts where they can actually physically do it or spatial learners. They need to see it. Yeah. Right. Visual learners, not. And so you have to balance all of that and create plans so that all your kids can learn well. And to be a great coach, you have to teach at a conceptual level. Bad coaches say, all right, on this play, you run this route. It's like, okay, I can memorize that. Well, that's what I was going to ask. But I don't understand it as deep as if we say, all right, here's the concept. Here's how it works. Here's what every route does and how they all relate to each other. And here's why it's so critical that you're here, do this, the details of it, and the why behind it. If you teach a kid the why, he'll never forget he has a freaking uh, go route or or an, a deep over route on that play because he understands why he's doing what he's doing. And then once they understand the concept and the why, you can format it however you want. And that kid could be anywhere running all kinds of different routes because they understand the big picture. So is more of like running the route tree, is that more about understanding more advanced concepts or the physical actually doing the route tree? Well, it's both. It's a combination of both. Gotcha. I mean, you got to become a master at each individual route in your in your, your route library. And then you have to know when to apply it and why to apply it, right? <clears throat> Those are kind of the three things you need to learn, like how to run the route at a high level and all the conversions. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> and then when you have that route and why. 
If you can get those three things taught and they fully grasp and understand it, you could truly level up. So here we go. This is awesome. I love seeing all these messages. Hey, I love all this. Matthew Peck, thank you for the two. You can afford it because you just won 800. Menace to picks, spent 22 on a five leg parlay, won $800. Queen, that clean literally, sweep. that paid just that one paid parlay for, paid, for, paid for Menace to picks for 20 months. That's Crazy. why it's worth it. Crazy. So uh, a receiver gets on campus. I'm Carnell Tate. I walk in the door. You're Brian Hartline. What is the first route you were teaching me? Well, we're going to start with formations. Okay. Teaching you where to line up. I mean, that's 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 a get-go because here's the thing about it. This is a process, right? If I come in early and I'm going to go through spring ball, if you learn the formations, you'll get to the right spot. And I could be behind you reminding you what route to run, giving you coaching points as you go. You got to get lined up first, mm -hmm. right? And it's truly a, a bullet point list, a prioritized list of, all right, Start with formations. Where do you line up? And then you go to routes and understanding routes because splits change. Like how, you know, you could call a formation and then you say, all right, I line up on the right on this formation. It's like, all right, but we call this concept. You need to learn the concept and learn what you do with your splits because you might change them for spacing. And so you start with formations and then you start teaching concepts and routes. Heard. No, I, I, I got you, I guess. And then the next question is more about what routes – do guys come in that need the most work? Like, do, like a lot. Of, I, I see a lot of All high school of guys come in with like kind of the footwork training, like the Instagram trainer routes. Yeah. Like, how hard is it to break those to, oh, to the point where you snap off a route? I came in today and I, and I was I was talking to you about AJ you know, Brown, about AJ Brown, how he's so big and the way he snapped off that slant route right before the half and was able to cut it outside. Like, you don't see guys doing that because so many guys worried about the, the speed ladder and like no, it's it look every cool. route, but it's every route from releases on go routes that are atrocious because of Instagram and, and poor high school coaching all the way to slant routes, just take a baby steps and, and not understanding coverages and how to run slant. I mean, it's every route, every route you could run. It's like blow it up and start over and build a foundation for every route. Got you. It's wide receivers that come from T offenses. I mean, I see Julian Fleming is kind of built like AJ Brown, but we haven't seen him snap off a route like that no. ever. And no. it would be absurd if he was ever able to. So, all right. We have a retirement. Henry Highstand has retired from Notre Dame football. He's done, um, you know, widely considered one of the best offensive line coaches ever. Did this surprise you? And how big of a deal is this for uh, for uh, The training? timing surprised me, but he, he's he's been an offensive line coach for 40 years. Crazy. 1983 was his first year coaching, and it's 2023. 40 years he's been an O-line coach. He is an absolute legend in the coaching circles. I mean, one of the best O-line coaches to ever do it. So he deserves his flowers for that. I mean, he was the Notre Dame O-line coach from 2012 to 17, then went on to, to coach at the Bears, kind of took a year or two off, came back last year to be the offensive line coach at Notre Dame. The timing surprised me, and I don't know the reason. You would think if he was going to retire, he'd retire after the bowl game, right. and we'd get the coaching search on. But I wonder how much of it had to do with a coordinator opening and who Marcus Freeman might be hiring at that coordinator position. Right, because it's an odd time, February 13th, to retire. That's something you do on January 13th. Like the timing was very bizarre. And it, it, it's either that he wasn't really feeling the direction, been coaching 40 years, I'm ready to hang it up. Or it was kind of deceiving with the offensive line recruits to say, all right, get through signing day, and then you can hang it up. Mm -hmm. You think he got passed up? You think that was kind of a feeling when he feels I, like he's getting passed up? I mean, this is up? a forty-year offensive yeah, like, line coach. I don't think want to call play. I don't think he had any aspiration to be the offensive coordinator at that point. You're just one of the best line. It's like Larry Johnson. Larry Johnson doesn't want to be the DC at this point. He might have fifteen years ago, mm -hmm. but at this point, he loves being a defensive line expert. Yeah, that's what he wants to be. That's what his legacy will always be. No sense jumping into a coordinator role like Kerry Combs did, and you know, tarnishing tarnishing your career like. Just be the best D-line coach that ever lived. Be the best O-line coach that ever lived. Yeah, it, it does It does feel weird, the timing of it, because, like, first of all, there was the like, kind of the rumors that he hung around the Chicago area, you know, waiting for Brian Kelly to leave to kind of go be an offensive line coach. You thought, like, Marcus Freeman would get maybe at least two years out of him because he is considered, like, the very, very best. Yeah, that's what you'd think. I mean, and I'm sure he thought that. I'm sure Marcus thought mm -hmm. that. But they, I don't know the reason, but I think there's really one reason. He wasn't really – he's 40 years in. You know, not in love with recruiting anymore. That was my and he's next looking question. at a coordinator change and saying, ah, this is a little too much. I'm I'm good. I'm done. Yeah, that, that's a big thing. I do think we're gonna see a lot of coaches like around that age retire sooner than they kind of would previously because of how much of a war zone recruiting's been. 
Like, like yeah. recruiting has been – it's it's a war zone now, well, especially for the older guys. that's the other thing. I mean, when he signed back up, NIL was like like a, like a, a baby, an infant. Yeah. We didn't know what it was going to grow up to be. It grew up to be a school shooter. Like, he's like, fuck this. I'm out. I thought it – I thought it might be a good kid, an honor roll student. This is a fucking mass murderer. I am out of here. <laughs> I want, I want no parts. And that's why, that's why I'm surprised a guy like Larry Johnson is still around. But more, more kudos to him because he lost some some battles this offseason that he, that he maybe would have won previously. But the yeah. NIL stuff kind of kind of made things a little bit tricky. Um, so you know, interesting. Notre Dame's in a, in a tricky spot, and now it feels like Marcus Freeman has now two. Sizable voids. Oh, massive. Yeah. A coordinator and O-line coach, that's your whole offense. And I love receiver coaches. I was one. But you better have a great O-line coach and a great coordinator or else you're going to stink. Especially this time of year. Yeah, he's got to go He's got to go pluck something big. Like, he, he's, he's got to. I love to. the Byron Leftwich hire a coordinator and then go get one of the best line coaches in the country and pay him a shitload of money. Go get, like, an NFL guy, you think? Because now, now, now the NFL guy yeah, you know, is, is, is who you call this time of year. Yeah, you you if you're going to hire Byron Leftwich, by, you ask me. Hey, Byron. Leverage him. Like, who have you worked with? Who's one of the best in the league? Like, who do you think we could get? And for that first cycle, like, an, an NFL guy, to me at least, is really big in recruiting. Yeah. It's like like when you walk into a parent's home, you know, it's not about, oh, we can develop you. It's like, no, no, I was in the NFL. Yeah, I coached Jason Kelsey. Yeah. I coached Trent Williams. Like, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm the epitome of, of offensive line coaching and development. Mm-hmm. So that, that's kind of that's where I'm at. Here we go. I don't know. I don't know how to pronounce the name. Ify Obadegwe. Obadegwu. Announced Ohio State, Maryland, Michigan as his top three Big Ten schools. What does Ohio State need to do to get him to Columbus if he comes to the Big Ten? I don't know. I have no idea. I'll have to, I'll have to definitely circle back. Um, that's a, a corner from the state of Maryland. Well, you got you to come correct. But, you know, having Michigan and Maryland in the top three makes you wonder about how big of a play NIL stuff is. Well, uh, I mean, Maryland has NIL he's a, ability. He's a Maryland kid. Mm hmm Kevin Blank's knocking on that door at Under Armour. He said, hello. <laughs> I know Loxley as well as anybody. If it's a big-time player in the state of Maryland, Kevin Plank is involved. Under Armour deals, shoe deals, they're talking all of it. Zach, what's it like being passed over for a coordinator job? I mean, it is what it is. You know, if, if you're a sensitive bitch, it stings, it sucks. I mean, it happened to me in 24, after 2014. I mean, not, not, not that I should have been the coordinator. Urban should have hired an outsider to come in, probably. But we had just won a national championship, so he wanted to keep it in-house. And Tom Herman, I mean, I've told the story a hundred times. He looked at me after he accepted the Houston job, and he was like, do you think Urban would make you the coordinator? And I was like, fuck no. Like, just because, <laughs> because of this, like, little brother syndrome that Urban had with me. And he was like, but you're the only one on, on offense that could call a play. I was like, I know, but he will never do that. So I guess I kind of got passed over, but it was not realistic. I was young, and, and he was not going to do that. But I didn't have an ego about it. I'm like, whatever. I'm just going to go try to be the best receiver coach in the country. And opportunities will come eventually. If I have to leave to do it, great. I'll do that. Like, people get in their feelings. And that's part of the reason Ed Warner got the coordinator job. Because Urban knew he would be a petulant fucking baby if he didn't get that job. And so, he was like water. The path of least resistance. Like, let's just keep everybody happy. Well, what's harder to replace? A wide receiver coach or an O-line coach? I'm an O-line coach. Unless you're a great recruiter. Like, it'd be, it'd be hard to replace Brian Hartline. Yeah. I mean, they they replaced me fine with Brian Hartline, and I was mm -hmm. a pretty good recruiter. So I think O line coaches are so. I mean, if you get a great O line coach, you have you have struck gold, gold. Yeah. Well, I mean, they were able to you know replace Stud with Justin Fry, and, and you know uh, capacity as well. So uh, we we uh, we will see about that. It is it is an interesting kind of point of discussion, interesting topic, just because like like if you had been with Ohio State, Zach, for say. 10 years or you were like had been all over the place as a wide receiver coach to get passed over would would be hurtful and we've seen kind of you know schools avoid that drama by promoting a guy like Harline by promoting you know their their big young hot shot coaches yeah and Elks just threw the super chat in there rumor is Utah OC is the new NDOC per cover three podcast today well if that happens that is the most underwhelming hire and no splash I mean guy that I forget his name he was the coordinator at Vanderbilt and then Utah, it's like, well, I mean, he might be a great coordinator. Maybe, you know, maybe, maybe he really knows offensive football, but that sure, certainly isn't a splash hire. Zach, I don't want to, I don't want to spend a lot of time talking about Ohio State basketball, but I thought this was an interesting discussion for this time of year. They lost again. They've been really, really bad. Awful. It's, it's comical now. It's, it is. It is. And, and, uh, oh, forever back, we saw CJ Stroud made a joke about, yeah, we would probably, 
like we could probably beat the uh, the basketball team if we had our own starting five. My guy Ron, after Ohio State lost, just dropped a video with the potential Ohio State starting five if they were to play, you know, basketball team versus football team in hoops. It's C.J. Stroud, Josh Proctor, Jaden Ballard, J.T. and Dewan Jones. Zach, if we had five games to twenty-one, do you think Ohio State football team could beat them? No, one time. No, no. you think the gap is that wide? Yeah, I mean these kids. That's. Just because you were a great talent doesn't mean you understand basketball as well as mm. a bad team. And they're a bad team at this level of college basketball. Like, they might be talented enough if you train. But they're they're mean level bad. You give them three months to train, play together, they're getting one of those games. Yeah, I mean, months. okay, so if, you, if you're going to give them six months to mm. learn high-level basketball and how to move and plays and all that shit. I don't know basketball, but whatever the fuck they do, pick and rolls and <laughs> suicides. And all, yeah, all, <laughs> run, run your fucking suicides, touch the uh. foul line, all that shit. They probably could play, hang with them. But if you just rolled them out there to play a game, no chance. When you recruited athletes, Zach, how many athletes do you think could have contributed on the basketball side if they if they needed to? Well, you talk, talk about elite receivers or elite corners. They, they could, you know, the, the really fast ones could be great defenders. I mean, uh -huh. Paris Campbell could have been a great basketball defensive player. I watched PC lock some shit up back yeah. in the back room. No, he ain't scoring it, Will. Mm -hmm. like, so I don't know. I, I can't really think of one. Um, off the top of my head that I coached that could have just because it, you got a that's a different skill set to be to, ball handling and, and, and all that. Yeah. A, a great defender, though. Yeah. But there were a handful of them. I think you could get like four good defenders. And then the one thing would be like, do you have two guys that are capable of scoring enough? Yeah. Is, is kind of the question. It's like, can Dewan Jones be in shape enough to give you, you know, 10 and 10? Yeah. Like I saw in the chat, Malik Hooker was one that I think could. I mean, he he was he was a fucking hooper. Yeah, no, for, for sure. Josh Proctor was a hooper too, yep. really athletic. But can he score against Sensabaugh? I think if you take Sensabaugh to the Ohio State picture, I think it looks more, it looks better. But then you think about the Ohio State basketball team. I mean, some of those guys were scoring like 30, 40 in, in high school. Right. Like, I don't know if any of our guys were doing that how except many, for just DeJuan. Just quick stat check. How many is Bronny average a game? Uh, I think around I think around like six this last year per Google search. I don't know if you guys know that. Bronny Bronny James, the superstar recruit, he averages like six points a game. Yeah, he's he's not averaging near the number you, that 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 you would think just based off the highlights. I saw somebody uh like clip the tournament of him dunking or whatever, and it's like in this game he scored four points. Stop trying to build this up to something it's not because we're gonna set ourselves up for a massive disappointment if he's not scoring at the next level. So I don't know, and, and maybe his game logs need updated. I have, I admit, I haven't really watched much. The couple games I have watched, he hasn't scored well, more than fifteen 30. points. Is what it is, Chris. I is just it pulled it up? That's from twenty one, twenty two. So that's two years ago. I don't even know. Oh, what, got you. What team that Sierra Canyon School in California? Yeah, I just, I well, I just looked at a, a more recent Max Preps yeah, thing, I don't know. and, and I, you know, those things never get updated, or if it's even done correctly. Um, but again, fifth, fifteen points a game in high school is nothing. When some of these guys, you see their average, like I mean, Luke Kennard averaged like what, like thirty six in Ohio. It's crazy. Like Joe Burrow averaged over twenty for Athens. So you know, I don't, I don't know. It is, it is what it is. This is interesting, Jonathan. Thank you for the ten. Never in a million years that I think Alabama would be ranked number one in men's basketball. Well, Ohio State is in complete shambles. I wish Gene would have never given Holtman that extension. Well, there's no doubt, and especially given extension. In a, in a cash strap time where now you can't afford the buyout, but guess what they can't afford, Chris? A ice hockey rink. They're doing fundraising actively right now, priority number one, to build a new ice hockey rink on campus. Ugh. What the fuck are we doing? The optics are bad. It just doesn't make sense, right? Like, I'm not, I love that Ohio State has 36 intercollegiate sports. I do. I think it's great. I think it's great that they, Shave a little off of football to fund a women's rifle team or whatever the fuck they, they fund. But at a point in time where you borrowed $48 million from the university because you're cash strapped, you're in such a deficit from COVID, you won't play nice with NIL collectives because you don't want to lose the donor money for projects like this. So now it's at least impairing Ohio State football, right? Yeah. The recruiting budget is not near the top 10. You're raising $3 million to build an ice hockey rink. For a program uh, uh, that is not going to bring in a penny. Georgia spends $5 million a year on recruiting. Alabama is up above $2 million. We don't have the money for any of that, but we're going to spend over $2 million on an ice hockey rink. 
It's going to be great, man. That hockey team for all their parents, there's going to be in a nice facility. Like my, the, my boy Q texted and he was like, you know what? Like, fine. They could throw that on the ice hockey rink. But if the new Woody, like if, if the new stadium or new football facilities don't at least 10 times more than that, throw a riot. Yeah. Well, listen, you, you spend that money when everything else is well-funded, right? Correct. If, I'm not saying you don't fund the sport. No, no. What is the cash cow to Ohio State? Football. Football and, and basketball kind of was at one point. So can we upgrade them first and then when the money starts hitting, then upgrade other stuff? Well, that's the thing. When you're cash strapped, you don't do this frivolous spending on a, on a fringe sport, right? They, had a, they, ha they have a place to play hockey right now. Yes. You're fully funding their program, scholarships, uniforms, all of that. Do they need a top-of-the-line ice rink? When you're strapped for money, you just took out a loan. It, it just doesn't make sense. Like, that's truly like, oh, man, I'm in debt bad. I'm going to take out a second mortgage on my house. And the next month being like, I'm going to buy a fucking four-wheeler. Like, mm -hmm. for what? You don't need a four-wheeler. You just had to take out a second mortgage. Now is not the time. It's great to buy a four-wheeler when you can. This is like, this is like those whatever, seven members of Congress that can't get a credit card. Like, what are we doing? Bad timing. It's like, damn, I'm saying I need a laptop for school. Let me take out a loan, but I'm going to go buy big red boots on Friday as well. Right. Like, no, we're not no. doing that. No, no, no. Like, that is a luxury item. Like, you're able to upgrade all your other sports because your football is taken care of. Your football is the mortgage. It's your house. It's your house. Why are you buying a 75-inch TV when you can't fill up your car with gas? Well, that's what it is, right? You're going to get your house repossessed because you're taking out loans to buy excessive shit that you don't need. It's just it, it, the, it's not that they're building the, the rink. I don't have a problem with that. No it's issue with it. It's the timing. Right now, you're strapped for cash. You're telling donors, hey, can I have a conversation with me? we really like to see what your goals are and what you want to support. Trying to pull them away from NIL collectives. And, and to keep it in your budget so that you can fund an ice hockey rink? Yeah. Just, just really bad. We can't get – so we can't get to $15 million for Ryan Day. Because, well, I mean, when we just – they just did a record year for donors donated to the program. And instead of trying to help the cash cow continue to be the cash cow, it's like, you know what? Hockey. Let's run it. We do support Ohio State hockey, though. I will be watching them on television next time they're on. So if someone wants to DM me or tag me, this is not – you know – I believe that all athletes matter, not just bas basketball and, uh, and football. Zach, interesting question. Rule hired a 24-year-old receiver coach who's never played or coached receivers. What are your thoughts? Well, I mean, he, he knows him really well, and he has a lot of conviction that he'll be great. The receiver coach is one of those things that it, it's, it's hard to be, you know, one of the best in the country. But if you are young, you can relate to kids, you can recruit, you can develop a receiver coach into a really good coach. Right, it's not a quarterback coach. It's not a line coach. Your receiver coach, if if the football IQ and mental capacity is there and the work ethic, you could become a great coach on the job. I think about Mike Vrabel as a D line coach. I've told the story a hundred times. He was not a great D line coach when Urban retained him. He became a great D line coach because he's smart, worked his ass off. You knew he could recruit. He had the name. He had the rings. He had the no, you know, the swagger, the personality. So it was a great hire. You just got to develop him into a great D line coach. And that's what happened with me. I think I was a good receiver coach when I got hired. Urban and, and Tom Herman. And I mean, a lot, a lot of people influenced my career. And then Ryan Day towards the end that made me a great receiver coach, in my opinion. But you can keep your opinion yourself. Fuck off. But I think <laughs> I was a really good receiver coach because guy, I learned from a bunch of guys. And then I started, you know, really focusing and spending time on being a receiver coach. And Brian Hartline wasn't a great receiver coach. He knew how to play receiver. But he learned, right? He learned the intricate details of teaching to become a great coach. So that just means Matt Rule has conviction in him. I, I love the hire. What's Matt Rule's uh, position of expertise? He's been everything. I mean, he, gotcha. he was a quarterback coach, tight end coach. He coached assistant offensive line coach. I mean, he's he's really coached everything in the core. I mean, he's never been a receiver coach or a running back coach, I don't think. But he he, he knows the center of – he knows football. Right. knows offensive football. And that's what I like. I trust like offensive coaches to like make their own hires on the offensive side because they'll be the safety net for things. If that makes sense. Like if he knows football so well, then Matt rule knows what, like, what do I need value wise? So I need a guy that's going to continue. Like, do I need a guy that's already proven and really good? Or do I need a young receivers coach who's going to continue to bring in talent? Because I know that there is a floor for this, you know, offensive yeah. passing attack. Yeah, for sure. For sure. And Chris, you're getting cooked in the chat right now. I don't know if you see it. You're truly on your LeBron James shit right now. In Akron, Ohio, Northeast Ohio, 
native wearing a Yankees hat. Oh, making this, people this, sick. This isn't just a Yankees hat though; it's a fake Yankees hat. That makes it better. Yeah, yeah. So it's like it's it's like kind of messed up. It's this artist that I really like. Like does like the little like makes logos, but makes them like like graffiti wise. I'm gonna need a Chief Wahoo hat stat. Okay, yeah. I mean, I I can I can see I can see what Buddy has. They do like the limited drops because it's kind of like not allowed. So you know you don't want to get a cease and desist letter. So the site's not open very often. But mm -hmm. yeah, wait, yeah, I got a Yankee. Hey, Y'all act like wait, wait a second, wait a second. Let me stop everybody right there. LeBron wears Yankees hats. That's the point. He's a sellout. Oh, that, yeah, that, that's Le the entire point. LeBron wears cowboy hats. He's a sellout. I know. We but don't I, like LeBron. But I'm supporting a a, a minority. Oh, here we go. Artist during yeah. this month. <laughs> come on now. It's Black History Month. Like, come, like, Free pass. Come, like, come on now. Let's come correct now. Free pass. Hey, hey I, I got this up here. West Dakota assassin, starting point guard, windmill dunk. Zach, are we flaming this fire a little bit too much? Or is the train going and not stopping now? Chris, Lincoln you. Lincoln Kineholtz. Who the fuck is we? You are flaming this fire hey, way the, too much. Hey, the cool thing is, nigga, we in this together. Oh, me no, okay. me and you, we on a screen at the same time. Okay. You got me? Lincoln Kineholtz. Have, have you seen it? Like, it's starting to get, like, they're starting to talk about, like, that's West Dakota Joe. Oh you know, God. the legacy's growing. Zach, hey, now, Zach, you talked about guys that have a little bit of shit to him. He's a three-sport athlete. He's potentially the best athlete to ever come from one of the Dakotas. He has Division One offers in all three sports. How do, I, how do I mute you? Where's the mute button for you? Well, no, the, the, we're plugged into the same board. If you mute me, you mute us both. Oh, like bullshit. I said. Watch <laughs> Don't unplug that. He's out. He can't talk anymore. You can only you can only hear him from my mic now. We just muted Chris. This is the way the show's going. I didn't want to put this up there while Chris is muted. Let him take a little time out. Uh, appreciate you, Zach. Just want to say I parlayed all the picks from Friday's show and won 15 hundo. I love the testimonies, Chris. I'll, I'll bring your mic back live, but enough of that. Enough of that. Vanilla Vic. Oh, my God. Hey, diddle, diddle, Lincoln Kineholds up the middle. There we go. That's even easier. <laughs> even easier. Now he can't talk. You can't even see him. Yeah, West Dakota's finest. I'm, I'm excited for the kid. I think he's got a chance to be a, a good player. Going to have a big learning curve, though, because he's coming from West Dakota, awful football, into big-time college football. And that's the last we'll say about Lincoln Kleinholz. Okay. Amir Reap posted um, he's, he's been working out. He wants to get back in. He wants to play again. Do you think he'll get another shot at college ball? Uh, maybe at a small school. He's not coming back to Ohio State. Three years out, hasn't played football in three years. Was a, was a decent player to start with, but he'll get a shot. Someone's going to take a flyer on a, a former Ohio State player mm -hmm. that just got exonerated by the courts. Was he good? I really, I really hope so. Um, I'm hoping that he he gets a shot somewhere because obviously, like, like, like whoever thinks what they think about him, whether he stunk or whether he was any good, whatever, he should have had the chance to prove it and develop himself into a player. And so I'm hoping he gets a, a spot somewhere else. I don't know how eligibility works. I don't know if he gets to claim a COVID year also or not. I, mean, I, I think he'll be fine. One, he can get a petition. They certainly will grant that petition. Yeah. And two, the NCAA doesn't even care anymore. These kids are coming back for their eighth year. So he, he definitely can play one, by hook or by crook one way. COVID, all the, whatever reason he wants, or the fact that he was just drugged through the mud for three years and and wasn't touchable for for a college football program. He'll he'll be able to play if if he finds a team that that wants him. Yeah, the way some of these teams have played defense, like I watch I watched Middle Tennessee State take Miami up top from the two yard line. So there's a lot of schools out there that uh that, that could use a corner just to, to get neither, it. neither of them are corners. Relax. Both of them are safeties. Neither oh, of them you. are corners. Well they well they had him in I I keep saying that. I, I know it's like like the whole Sean Wade was a slot corner thing, and he yeah. was like Sean Wade's backup. So I he's guess that's safety. more of a nickel safety. Yeah, he's a safety type beat. Both of them are safeties. Yeah, I, I hope he does get a chance to play. Um, good news, Cameron Babb, Standard Ohio State, is program coordinator at the Eugene Smith I love it. Leadership Institute. I don't really know what that is, but it looks like a great G headline G for Smith, Cameron. He launched the Leadership Institute, basically, where they're teaching leadership classes on campus. People can sign up for the classes. Really, I think it's a cool deal. Urban was a part of it. Cam Babb's the perfect person to become a part of it from just, you know, just his stories and and, and how strong of his character. And he's a great speaker, faith-based. I mean, everything about it. Just phenomenal hire. Awesome for the program and awesome, awesome for Cam Babb. You have that opportunity. There it is. There it is. I'm really happy for Cam Babb. He's one of my all-time favorite Buckeyes. And anything that's anything that's good. Um, for him, I will absolutely no doubt, for. no doubt. And I want to, I want to throw this in here, Chris, just a reminder, our partners over at Manscaped, um, if you, they, whatever you want, the performance package is outstanding. The new beard trimmer they put out is outstanding. The nose hair trimmer is, is top of the line. Everything they do is top of the line. 
And if you want to go to manscaped.com, promo code menace, you get 20% off of free shipping. So I want to just wanted to remind you, I really wanted to put her on the screen, but I wanted to remind you that that, that promo is still going. Our partners have that, that promo code kicking you 20% off and free shipping. So go grab that while you got it because it's, it's, it's truly high, high, high end product. Oh, Zach, get us out of here. Okay. I just want to put the other one up real quick. Sheesh. That's the one. Oh, I love boobs. Anyways, <laughs> I appreciate you, Menace Army. Menace out. <laughs>